I love that song of um, love, joy, and peace way down deep. We used to sing a chorus called I've Got the Joy, Joy, Joy Down in My Heart. My grandpa McLean used to say, some of y'all got that joy so far down in your heart, nobody can find it. It's one of the reasons that uh, we're talking about this subject this summer called joy and laughter. You never can have too much. You can only have too little. We spent the first several weeks looking at what the Bible has to say about laughter. Um, uh, somewhere in the history of the church, uh, folks got the idea that uh, if you became a Christian, you had to be serious and somber all the time. And joy and laughter went out the window. And we want you to know that the Scripture gives us lots of reason to laugh, all right? Uh, there's a biblical foundation for that. And so we spent several weeks looking at uh, what the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, wrote about the subject of laughter in the book of Proverbs. Over the last couple of weeks, we've transitioned from laughter, which is the outward expression of what should be in the life of a Christian inward reality, and that is joy. Joy ought to be at the heart of all of our laughter. We're going to even discover in the next couple of weeks how joy can exist in our lives even in the midst of trouble and challenges, difficult circumstances. And when we have that heart of joy that comes in the person of Jesus Christ in us, then there can be a wellspring of laughter at any moment, at any time, during the good, the bad, and the ugly moments of life. But we've got to come to grips with what this joy really is. And I would even suggest to you that laughter without this joy is certainly temporary, and there's a good possibility it's artificial. But when this laughter in our heart comes out of this wellspring of joy that Christ brings to us in a relationship with him, then even in the troubled moments of our life, that sense of joy can overflow into laughter at difficult moments. And so, uh, we spent a couple of weeks ago looking at the opening verses of the book of Philippians. I would invite you to turn there if you would, please. You'll find the little letter to uh, the church at Philippi tucked away between Romans and Revelation. It's only about three or four pages long, uh, but you'll find it between Romans and Revelation, the latter part of the New Testament. And today, we're going to pick up where we left off last week, looking at, kind of analyzing the prayer that Paul was praying for this church at Philippi. This was a church that Paul had started probably uh, 15 to 20 years before he wrote this letter. Paul was the founding pastor of that congregation. And uh, let me tell you about, just remind you, in case you don't know who some of the charter members, the original members of the church at Philippi were. Uh, one of the very first ones, if not the first one, now hang on to this, she was a Gentile, okay? She was, since I'm saying she, she was a woman, she had no gender identity issues, okay? She was a woman in business, first century, okay? Gentile businesswoman. And she got saved, charter member of the church. Second member, Roman guard, prison guard, about ready to cut his own throat because the prison doors flew open and he thought that Paul and his partner had escaped. And if you were a prison guard, the verdict on your life was death if you let a prisoner escape from a Roman jail. And Paul stopped him. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Look in these prison cells. Nobody's left. There's no great escape here. You see, the purpose of this miracle of the jail doors opening was not so we could get out, but it was so you could find your way in to Jesus Christ. And that head guard took Paul home that night and fed him. And that night around the dinner table, that guard and all of his family gave their life to Jesus Christ, charter members of the church at Philippi. Third one was a demon-possessed girl who Paul had met in the streets of Philippi. And he cast out the demons from her life, and she was now restored to her right mind. And with her mind right, she then got her heart right. And so the original three members of this church was a demon-possessed teenager, a Roman guard and his family, and a Gentile businesswoman. And from that small cluster of charter members, the church at Philippi had grown 
Paul loved them dearly. It was like his child. And 15 to 20 years later, as he is in prison in Rome under house arrest, they're still sending representatives from the church to see how Paul is doing, to minister to his needs, to care for him. And so Paul spends the first eight verses thanking them for their expression of love they've shown to him all these years and how much he loves them. And in just a moment, we're going to pick up and look at the four aspects that Paul prays for in terms of their spiritual growth. But since this is a series on laughter and joy, I figured maybe it's been a while since I told any jokes at the beginning of a sermon. So here's what I did this week. I googled best church jokes. I will tell you, two of them I could not tell in church. <laughs> I'm just telling you, two of them I can't tell in church. Now you guys are going to be Googling, which ones are they? So let me tell you, pick up a, a, a couple that I, I, I found. There was a man who's talking to God, and he said, God, how long is a million years? And God answered him and said, to me, about a minute. Man looked at God and said, God, how much is a million dollars? God said to me, it's a penny. And the man looked up at God and said, God, can I have a penny? <laughs> to which God replied, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. All right, now the rest of you are getting it. All right, yeah. All right, here, here's, here's a few other little short ones. What time of the day was Adam created? Just a little before Eve. <laughs> Who was the fastest runner in the race? Adam. He's always first in the human race. Ah. Okay, here's a, okay. You all know what atoms are? A-T-O-M-S, not Adam, A-D-A-M, but atoms, all right? You know, atoms, molecules. Okay, all right. Why are atoms Catholic? Because they have mass. <laughs> that was really good. You got to like that one. All right, come on. That one was so good. All right. Why didn't they play cards on the ark? Because Noah was always standing on the deck. All right, one last one. One last one, then we'll be done. What kind of man was Boaz before he married Ruth? Absolutely ruthless. <laughs> uh, Bible trivia fun. All right. Let's get serious now. Let's read verses 9 through 11. And Paul says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and you may be pure and blameless, until the day of Christ. Let me just qualify real quick. The day of Christ. It's one of two moments. It's either the day that Christ returns and we are caught up to be with him. It'll be the most incredible ride you've ever been on in your life. Or the day in which we die and he walks with us through the valley of the shadow of trouble and death. Which, whichever it is for us. We will be filled up until then with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and to the praise of God. So having expressed his love for them and his gratitude for their love for him, Paul prays that they grow in four aspects of their spiritual maturity. He prays that they will grow in spiritual devotion, love, he prays that they will grow in spiritual discernment. He prays they will grow in their spiritual development, healthy growth. He prays that they will grow in spiritual deportment. I needed a word that meant behavior that began with a D, okay? So, spiritual deportment. In, in one of his books, James Emery White tells of the Russian-American comic, Yakov Smirnoff. Y'all remember him? 
got to go back about 25 years, all right? It was really popular around here. Uh, he writes about Smirnoff's initial response to the incredible variety of instant products available in American grocery stores. He said, on my first trip, I saw powdered milk. You just add water and voila, you get milk. I saw powdered orange juice. Just add water and voila, you get orange juice. Then I saw baby powder. And I thought to myself, what a country. What a country. Wouldn't it be great if, 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 if childbirth was as easy as adding water? <laughs> well, it's, I guess it sort of is, isn't it? All right. Yeah, water, you know. All right. Come on, guys. Work with me here. But it's not. Paul's prayer to the Philippians is so important about spiritual maturity because it's not as easy as just adding water. Uh, let me explain something very quickly. Spiritual growth is not complicated. It's not. It's very simple. But having said that, it's not easy. It's just like becoming a Christian. It is not a complicated procedure. It's very, very simple. But it isn't easy. Because the choice that we must make for both of them challenges us at the core of who we are as a human being. We like to be in charge of our own destiny. We like to be the pilot of our own ship. We like to think we're the one responsible for how good we turn out. We like to blame everybody else for how bad we might turn out. But we want the credit for how good we turn out. So to become a Christian is simple. Believe that Jesus is God the Son. Invite him to come live in your life and forgive you of your sins. And you will be saved. No list of do's and don'ts. No theological test you have to take in order to be admitted to the family. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your lips, you will be saved. Simple, right? But not easy. The hard part is to admit that all have sinned, including me, and fallen short of God's glory. Now, just as salvation is simple but not easy, spiritual maturity is simple but not easy. You see, I can, I can outline it very quickly in four things. Easy steps to spiritual growth. Pray a lot. Read a lot. Fellowship a lot. I guess that's three, not four. Oh, yeah, fourth one. <laughs> this is the hard part. Obey a lot. That's the four steps to spiritual growth and maturity. It's not complicated, but it isn't easy. So, last week we looked at growth and spiritual devotion. That your love may abound, verse 9. That your love may abound still more and more. Since we talked about it, I'm not going to spend much time, just way of review. He talks here about the possession of love, and then he talks about the progression of love. Remember the day you got married? Don't you love your spouse more now than you did that day? You thought you never could. You thought, man, I have hit the pinnacle of love. And then you discovered, man, you hadn't even touched. In fact, quite frankly, some of y'all look back on the day you got married and you realize you really weren't in love at all that day. You were infatuated. And after 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you really now understand what love is all about. It grows. That's what Paul is sharing with the folks at Philippi. Hey, I want you to not only know that you have love, Christ in you, but I want you to progress in that love, the expression of Christ through you. Paul uses the word abound, and he's talking about the extent of their love, that they should reach more people with the love of God. For the Bible says the world will know we are Christians by our good behavior. <laughs> that doesn't hurt any, but that's not the way we'll know we are Christians. They'll know we are Christians by our love. And then he uses the phrase, it's a double positive rather than a double negative, that you may abound more and more. The more and more is the effectiveness of their love. I not only want you to reach, but as you reach, I want that love to have an effect upon people around you. 
And he tells us that this can only come with knowledge and discernment. Love becomes greater in its extent and more powerful in its effect when we, ming- when we allow these, these twin words to direct our love, knowledge and discernment. Without knowledge, the Philippians wouldn't know whom to love. Like Lydia, a Gentile businesswoman. Like a young teenage girl, demon-possessed teenager. Like a Roman centurion. And discernment. Without discernment, they wouldn't know how to love those to whom they have been sent. When love is controlled by these virtues, it fulfills the highest goal of both God and our humanity. So we'll pick up right now with where we left off last week. We'll look at growth and spiritual discernment, all right? The first one was our spiritual devotion. This was now our spiritual discernment. Verse 10 says that you may approve the things that are excellent. Most scholars translate this phrase, just as I've rendered it, approve what is excellent. Others have rendered it this way, test things that differ. It doesn't take much wisdom to select the good instead of the bad. We've briefly talked about that already. It's usually most of us don't struggle with is this right or wrong. Sometimes where we struggle with is what is best rather than better. How do we figure that out? Our growth in grace is indicated by the discrimination that rules our lives of being able to critique what is best from what is good what is best from what is better. As we grow in our faith, our spiritual discernment, we will begin to reject some habits and practices that we once approved. Not because we've come to a point that we think those habits may have been bad for us, but simply because they should be replaced with other habits that are even better for us. We often are blinded by rules for the sake of our appearance. I don't know if you grew up at a church at all that had a list of rules that was far more than the Ten Commandments. The Bible had Ten Commands and the church had 25 rules. And that was often done for appearance sake so that folks would look and say, oh yeah, I know they're Christian because they don't go to the movies. Is that what most folks say? Oh, you're a Christian because you don't do this or because you do this? No, the Bible says they'll know you're Christians by your love. And so we connect this to the principles of God. And, 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 and in Romans, Paul spoke of exercising, Paul spoke of this exercise of learning to determine between what is better and best when he said in verse 2 of chapter 12, you and I should know what, it, what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. The perfect, not just what falls into the will of God, but what is the perfect will of God for your personal life. That There's a book out, been out for quite some time called The Power of Habit about how so much of our daily life is lived by habit. We have to live that way. Our brain needs habits in order for us to function at a really high level. You see, just about everything we do is habitual. How many of you wake up about the same time every morning, whether your alarm is on or off? Yeah, yeah. Now, there's a few of you sleepyheads who you can sleep right through your alarm, all right? My oldest son is that way, all right? All right, he can have that alarm right here by his head, and he'll sleep right through it. But, but most of us, we, we develop a, a habit, a routine. How many of you kind of go through the same routine Monday through Friday when you get up and get ready to go to work? It's kind of the same every single morning. Yeah, it's okay to raise your hand. Yeah, okay, most of you do. Yeah. Th- th- these are routines that we get. Um, h- how about the way we walk? How many of you think about whether you're going to leave with your right foot or your left foot when you take off to walk? When you get up out of a chair, how many of you think, I wonder how many steps it is to where I'm going? No, you don't, because you have an iPhone that will keep track of that for you, all right? It will tell you exactly how many of them that you've, you've gone through, okay? Um, I only have one pair of pants that has the phone pocket on the right leg, all right? So I sometimes don't know where I put it. It hasn't become a habit yet. Um, when you're two, 
and you're learning to walk, your brain spends a lot of energy training your brain to walk and shift weight so that you're balanced. You ever watch the two-year-old learn to walk? All right, they, they're a little off balance. Why? Because their brain hasn't figured out this habit of walking yet. They're just learning. But oh, by the time they're three, they give no thought, man. They are gone like a bullet. Now, we don't ever think about our walking again until we get to be nearly 80. And then we, our brain goes back to being a child again. We have to think about every step that we take, all right, because our balance isn't quite as good anymore. But, but if we had to think about every single movement or how we do anything, our brain would be overwhelmed. We wouldn't get anything done. God designed our brains in a way that most of what we do is done in a very small part of the brain that just takes over so it can free up our conscious brain for things that require more energy. Try a little experiment with me, all right, to help understand this. Everybody put your hands down to your side for a moment. Put your hands down to your side for a moment. Okay, now cross your arms. Did you think about that? Okay, put your hands back down to your side for a moment. Now, don't cross your arms till I say now. This time, I want you to cross your arms the opposite way. That's not very easy, is it? You had to think about it. You should see me in my office this morning trying to figure that one out for a moment, all right? It, it took me about a minute, all right, to realize, oh, that is hard. You see, um, almost everything we do, we do by habit, series of habits, walking, talking, eating, driving a car. Remember when you first learned how to drive a car? You would get it, and you would sit down, and then you would think, insert key, Okay, put on seat belt, start ignition, adjust the mirrors, look behind you. Do you think about any of those things now? No. Now you get in with a cup of coffee in one hand and an iPad in the other, and you know, and you just do it and you're back and, and you don't even realize you look back. But if you hadn't, you would no longer be driving. Okay? But you did it, and you don't even remember doing it. Why? Because this little bitty part of our brain that's called the amygdala, part of your brain, uh, that is what goes into gear to do the hard work of which foot goes first and what stepping motion works so that you can focus on any surprises. As you climb a set of stairs, you don't think about each step. Why? Because that little bitty part of your brain called the amygdala is functioning so that the rest of your brain is free to look for traps for things that might be in the way so that your survival mode kicks in at an appropriate pace. It's really a cool function of the brain that helps us handle all the decisions we face constantly day after day. And, and here's what dawned on me. If that is true, then it makes me wonder how much of what we do spiritually is done by instinct and not decision making. It's more of a habit for us rather than it is a temptation from the evil one. We've become a Christian and we've created some new habits, but are they the best habits that God has in store for us? Because not only is the good stuff habitual, but so are the things that we need to change. And it's hard to change our habits. I had another visit to the heart doctor this week, checking cholesterol levels and all those kind of things. And... Um, it wasn't a favorable visit. No, nothing serious, so don't get anybody panic, freak out. No, I'm, but cholesterol's higher than it was. Okay? Other things, not where they want it. Maybe you need to change some habits. Okay? So I started three, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, Shai and I started dieting already. Right after the blood work, we started dieting. <laughs> Didn't know the results yet, knew they weren't going to be good. So, it's, I, I'm confident if they did blood work today, things would be a little better than they were six weeks ago. But the last three weeks, every evening, I've been getting off the couch at about 8.30 to 9, and I walk for an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Okay? Brisk, late, hitting it. Feel better. Hopefully, it's lowering some of those things that it needs to be lowered. But you see, up until then, you know what my habit was? Once I get home from here, and if there's nothing else to do, couch potato, okay? 
Doctor told me I can't run. That was my excuse for not exercising anymore. Hey, bad habits. Bad habits lead to poor consequences. Change our eating style. We've done that considerably. Now, does that mean I'm never going to eat peach cobbler again? No. I'm going to eat it again. This time, though, I won't eat the whole peach cobbler. When I sit down, I'll have just a piece, all right? It's called moderation in some of these things. But we, we have to create some new habits. It, it, you see, it's easy. Well, let me say it differently. It's simple, but it's not easy. Because at 9 o'clock, I'm ready to get out of my clothes and into my bed. So you got to make a hard choice. And the first week or two, it was hard for me to make that choice. Now, I want to make the choice because I realize I feel better. The same thing is true spiritually for us. The more that we abide in his word, the more we talk to God in prayer, the more that we congregate in small assemblies and big assemblies in the church and we are encouraged and fed spiritual food, the more we realize how we need it and how much better we're feeling. We must learn to test and discern what is God's best for us and for others. The next thing is growth in spiritual development. He says in verse 10 that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Sincerity speaks of the absence of hypocrisy. Paul prayed that believers in Philippi would be genuine in their lives. He wanted them to be real in their walk with God. Don't say one thing one day and behave a different way the next day. Just a few verses later, he spoke of some who had been preaching Christ not sincerely. And I don't want to go off on a tantrum here, but in our current culture, it's most of those that you will find on TV who are preaching not sincerely. Not all. You got, you got the Stanley father and son team on TV. They're good. And you got the Stanley father and son team on TV, and they're good. We just got a big, beautiful beautiful pictorial book on a new center that's been developed down in San Diego. The, the facility is absolutely gorgeous. Okay? And I would be inclined to visit. I mean, they had people from Disney create this catacomb experience for you down there. And then I saw who the designer, architect, builder, and fundraiser was for it. And he's a con man and a crook. He's not sincere. So we have to be able to discern those kind of things. And Paul says in your daily life, your daily walk with God, be the person, the man, the woman that Christ is in you. You don't do this for selfishness and vain ambition. Be who you are. It's one of the things I love about Celebrate Recovery. Yeah, there we go. Okay? Hurts, habits, or hang-ups. And that impacts all, impacts all of us from any walk of life. But the biggest thing, you won't stay and celebrate recovery long if you're not going to be real. If you're not going to be genuine. A part of being real and genuine is acknowledging your hurts, your bad habits, and your hang-ups. God loves us in spite of those. Now, that's not an excuse to stay in them. And that's what Celebrate Recovery is all about, is finding freedom from those things that have brought destruction for us. Till we ever own up to those, we never find progress. This is not a most eloquent phrase, but it's a memorable one. Be who he is, because if he is who he ain't, he ain't who he is. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Be who we are in Christ. At the village church in Russia, attendance at Sunday school picked up after the priest started handing out candy to the peasant children. One of the most faithful was a pug-nosed lad who recited his scriptures with proper piety, and he pocketed the rewards, and then he fled to the fields out back so he could munch on them. The priest took a liking to this boy, persuaded him to attend the church school during the week. That was preferable for him to doing household chores from which his devout parents excused him. By offering other inducements, the priest managed to teach this boy the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, he won a special prize for learning all four by heart and reciting them nonstop in church. 
Can you imagine reciting Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? That would have been a long church service. And he did it. Then 60 years later, this boy, now man, still liked to recite scriptures, but in a context that would horrify the old priest, he would make fun of it. For the prized pupil who memorized so much of the Gospels was Nikita Khrushchev, the former communist czar. As this story illustrates, the why behind his memorization is fully as important as the what. The same Khrushchev who nimbly mouthed God's word when a child later declared God to be non-existent because his cosmonauts had not seen him in space. Khrushchev memorized the scriptures for candy, for rewards, for bribes, rather than for the meaning that it had in his life. Artificial motivation will produce artificial results. And Paul said, I want you guys to grow in your spiritual development with sincerity. Have a sincere love for God and then live out that sincere life, he says with the next phrase, without offense. This refers to the ever-present danger of causing another person to stumble. The Greek word here is scandalon. Don't live a scandalous life. Originally referred to the part of a trap in which the bait was attached. If a person is an offense, he does that which causes another to fall into the trap. Beware of false teachers and preachers. They're setting a trap. Paul's passion was that these believers would live so that no one would stumble because of their life. And most of the folks who caused people to stumble in the time that Paul wrote were peoples whose names were Pharisees and Sadducees. They were religious leaders who were doing their religious stuff for the purpose of power, money, and influence. Artificial motivation brings artificial results. And Paul said, watch out for them. So grow in this area of your spiritual development so that you don't live like they do. Last of all, growth in spiritual deportment behavior. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. I, I understand that in, uh, on report cards uh, from like my parents' generation, there was a section on the report cards for a grade on deportment. When I went to Winchell Elementary School, it was called classroom behavior. You all remember that? Remember all your report cards? And My folks turned there first when I brought my report card home. They didn't look to see if I got A or B in classes, all right? They looked to see how my behavior in class was. I know you all will find this very hard to believe, but frequently written in that section on the report card were these words, talks too much in class. <laughs> I got rewards when I didn't have that written on my report card, all right? Paul wanted the believers in Philippi to get high marks in life behavior. In fact, he prayed that their hearts and lives would produce a rich spiritual harvest. If their roots were in Jesus Christ, then the harvest should be the fruits of righteousness which come by Jesus Christ in us. Last night as I went for my walk, I was thinking about today's message. And I began to reflect personally about growing older and spiritual maturity. In 30 days, I have to sign up for Medicare. So I have to acknowledge I'm growing older. And I realized that at this stage in life, I have a decision. It's quite frankly the decision we have at every stage of life. It just sometimes has a different twist depending on our stage. But I realize I have two choices at this stage of my life. Will I allow my chronological age to be that which shapes my spiritual development? I have to be careful here because I don't want anybody to think I'm talking about you. I've watched this over my lifetime. It's not true for everybody. There are exceptions I could throw out, but I've, I've witnessed this a lot, that when folks get to a certain age of retirement, 
there's almost a sense that they are retired also from Christian growth and maturity. How many seniors have you heard say, I love being a senior, I can say whatever I want to? No, you can't. And no, you shouldn't. I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. Yes, you have wisdom to impart, and yes, you have knowledge that should be shared. But remember, motivation and action go together. What's the purpose of it? Hey, I'm retired. I don't, I, I've studied the Bible for 30, 40 years. Why do I need to keep doing? Well, I, why do I, I, I understand if you can't drive and get out anymore, but age other than that should not be an excuse for not being engaged in Bible study. How about have folks drive to your house now? You see, will I allow my chronological age to shape my, will, will I become stunted as I get older? Or will I choose to allow spiritual maturity to shape my aging character? Will I still allow the Holy Spirit to produce in me more and more of the fruits of righteousness? Will I live by habit or will I live by choice? So on my walk last night, I thought through the fruits of righteousness and what would Jesus like to reflect through me in this next stage of life that I'm entering? It's uncharted territory for me. I've never been older than 65, and I'm not yet. <laughs> but I haven't been there before. And here's, here's what I came up with last night for a desire list. As I grow older numerically and spiritually, my, my spiritual age is five years behind my chronological age. So at least for the next 10 years, when people ask me how old I am, I'm going to go off my spiritual birth and not my <laughs> physical birth. But here's what I came up with in regards to the fruits of righteousness. You're going to write these down, babe, because you're going to have to remind me about these, okay? <laughs> I have them. I have them here. You don't have to actually write them. You see, I want to grow kinder as I grow older, not more stubborn. We often use our age as an excuse to be stubborn. Shame on us. I desire to grow more patient, not more frustrating or frustrated. I want goodness to flow freely rather than selfishness. I desire peace to fill the atmosphere of my life, not dissension. I want joy to be like a rushing spring and not just a trickle. I desire contentment over dissatisfaction in the circumstances of my life. I have no idea what the full extent of retirement will be for me, but I want to be content in whatever it is. Didn't Paul say, I know what it is to have nothing, and I know what it is to have abundance, and I've learned at either end of the spectrum, I will be content. I want love to be more evident in my life. The love for God the love for my family, and love for others. So I have a choice to make. Which will be the controlling influence of my life? The frustration of growing older chronologically or the fruitfulness of maturing spiritually? See, if godly love is defined as seeking the best interest of the one loved, then Paul's love for the Philippians certainly qualifies. How blessed they were to be among his disciples. Victor Frankel, if you all don't know that name, I hope you'll Google it when you leave here today. Victor Frankel. He was a uh, Viennese Jew who was interned by the Germans for three years in a concentration camp at Auschwitz. While he was in there, he and a friend who both had been separated from their wives to different concentration camps. And they were being driven, they were walking, but being driven as they walked to a place of work that day. They were so beaten and worn out, they were leaning on each other for support as they walked. And the man next to Frankel whispered, Oh, if our wives could see us now. I do hope they're better off where they are 
and don't know what's happening to us. And Frankel then writes this. That brought thoughts of my wife to mind. And as we stumbled on for miles, slipping, supporting each other, dragging one another onward and upward, we both knew each of us was thinking of his wife. Occasionally I looked at the sky where the stars were fading and the pink light of the morning was beginning to spread behind a dark bank of clouds. But my mind clung to that picture of my wife, imagining it with an uncanny acuteness. I heard her answering me. I saw her smile, her frank and encouraging look. And at that moment, a thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth that is said into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many brilliant thinkers. I discovered the truth that love is the ultimate and highest goal for which we can aspire. And then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart, that salvation is through the love of God and in Jesus Christ. Great love. No greater love has no man than this, that one laid down his life for a friend. As Paul would add at the end of this prayer, there is real joy in loving, a joy so genuine as we will see in the next chapter of Philippians that it sustains us even in the midst of adversity. So we have a choice to make. Do we want this wellspring of joy to bubble up in us personally as well as us collectively? Because remember, Paul wrote this to the church. Yes, it's individually applied, but it's collectively worked. I want us to live out the reality of a quote of Vance Havner. Vance Havner said, snowflakes are frail, but enough of them get together, they can stop traffic. I want New Hope to be a church in our community that stops traffic long enough for people to discover the love of God. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for what you moved in Paul's heart to write, and thank you for the way in which you preserved this for 2,000 years so it's available to us today. Father, just as Paul prayed for the church that he pastored back then, I pray for this church today. I pray for us that we will grow in spiritual devotion and discernment and development and behavior. We, we don't compare ourselves to others. We simply, Father, say, God, where do you want to take me next? And we take the next step of growth. Give us the wisdom to discern between better and best, making those choices about habits and lifestyle and decisions that are directed and motivated by you. Give us the wisdom to know the difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go have a great day.